All right, and we are live. Welcome to the Biblos Network. We are glad you have joined us today. It is the middle of summer. It is hot. And yet, in the midst of it all, God is doing great things. It has been a whirlwind of activity. <clears throat> we just returned from the Peak Conference in Tulsa, Oklahoma, and the power of God filled that place. It was such a miraculous outpouring of God's Spirit. If you were there, you know what I'm talking about. And we had a lot of Biblos fans that were there that came up to say how they enjoyed the program, and we're thankful for everybody that's able to tune in and and share the good things of God with us. Um, the preaching, the music, it was just so good, such a wonderful uh, outpouring of the Spirit of God. A couple of sessions, you know, Brother Cornelius Williams did an amazing job sharing his testimony, and, and Brother Jeremy Wilbanks on Thursday morning was simply unreal. He got into the role of the Word and how it plays such a pivotal role in in a believer's worship and praise and and the infilling of the Holy Ghost evidenced by speaking with other tongues. And the title of his message was His Words in My Mouth. And he delved into Greek and explored Greek foundational dynamics and tied it to how the expressive Word of God comes forth from us. And one of the lines that he had in there, just, it was amazing, was keep on praying until his words come out. It was so good, so good. So it's worth your time to, to listen to that. And all the speakers did a great job. Um, Bishop Holmes did a great job Wednesday night and and um, Thursday night, Brother Williams, and then the day sessions. Brother Joel Booker did fabulous, a fabulous job, The Sun and the Shadows. It, was, it is worth your time to go listen to that. So it was excellent. So we're thankful for that. We took a bus full of kids. I don't know. I think like 50 people or something went up there. And I don't know how long that is, 1,000 miles, 1,200 miles. It's a long trip. And the kids stopped over in Memphis and then Little Rock. They went by the Little Rock Church and prayed there, had a great prayer meeting. And the bus just trundled its way across the United States, half the continental United States from Durham all the way to Tulsa, and made a lot of great memories along the way and back. <clears throat> so it's been good. It's been a good day for me personally. We had some great real estate news. Some of our um, investments have really, really come to fruition, and some new things have come to light that are exciting developments here at the church locally. And um, we had three brand new people get baptized in Jesus' name today. Some Bible studies that I've been teaching, they they wanted to get baptized, so we baptized them right before the Bible study. Then we had Bible study, and I just thought, man, you just cannot beat that. Um, just wonderful things. And, and we're also installing new cameras in our sanctuary and around our, our property because we are beginning 24-hour-a-day prayer, 24 hours a day, seven days a week. People can come in. They have an access code. They can come in and pray in the sanctuary at any time, day or night and just touch God, get a hold of God. We have wanted to do that. There's some logistical problems. You know, we got to put up cameras. We got to make uh, things a certain way to where people can do it responsibly, but we are excited about it, and I can't wait to see what's going to come from it because a praying people will make a difference. God responds to praying people. <clears throat> so it's been exciting. It's been good. Um, I have received your feedback. One of the things that I immediately heard was last week's session with my brother Joel we loved having him on. We got into some great things. And then for one, some weird reason, we uploaded it. Um, and it cut off the last 10 minutes of the session. So I, I heard that in spades. You guys got a hold of me real quick. <laughs> we got bombarded. Um, like, man, where's the feed at? What happened to the, what happened to the session? And so we're going to, we're going to work on a fix for that and get that extra 10 minutes uploaded for you and try to put it on the same link. So it's going to be good. Looking forward to it. I love it when, when Joel can be with me. We talk about a lot of good things, and, and some of the best stuff we talked about was in that last, tism, that, that last 10 minutes. So hopefully we can, we can get that up for you. But great things. It's, it's an exciting time to be serving God, and, and I just come to you, say thank God, praise the Lord, give thanks to God. Praise the Lord. I was thinking of this the other day. I love this 
apostolic lifestyle. I love the eclectic, what the Bible calls peculiar, the peculiar people of God, the chosen generation, the royal priesthood, the peculiar people that show forth his praises. One of the distinctives of of apostolics is that when we greet one another, we'll shake hands or I guess post COVID we do fist bumps and we will say, praise the Lord. And it's just, I, I don't know of many other people that do that, but, but Pentecostal folk, we like to do that. And there's a reason why we do that. Um, people think that it's just a cultural curiosity. It is not. It is actually those old timers back in early Pentecost, the post Azusa days, they would read the Bible and they would get these little nuggets out of the scripture and they would incorporate them into their daily lives. So my grandfather did it. My, my great grandfather did it. Apostolics around the world do it. And so it comes from Isaiah 12 and they, they read this and they put it into practice. They believed it with all their heart and they said, you know what? That's us. We're doing that. Here's what the Bible says, Isaiah 12. And in that day thou shalt say, O Lord, I will praise thee. Though thou wast angry with me, thine anger is turned away, and thou comfortedst me. Behold, God is my salvation. I will trust and not be afraid, for the Lord Jehovah is my strength and my song. He also is become my salvation. If you read that in Hebrew, it says he has become my Yeshua, or he has become my Jesus. So Jesus is in the Old Testament, if you read Hebrew. Therefore, with joy shall ye draw water out of the wells of salvation. That's a powerful metaphor for receiving the gift of the Holy Ghost. This references the woman at the well. This references the living water that he would give to us. And so when you get the Holy Ghost, you are drawing water out of the wells of salvation. And it's out of the wells of Yeshua, if you read it, out of the wells of Jesus. Verse 4, and in that day shall ye say, here it is, praise the Lord. Call upon his name, declare his doings among the people, make mention that his name is exalted. So apostolics, we love that. We believe that. We practice that. We see ourselves in that. We exalt his name. That's the name of Jesus. We say, praise the Lord. We draw water out of the wells of salvation. And I love this apostolic distinctive. I love our lifestyle. I love the way that we we strive to follow the word of God as, as closely as we can. And so anyway, it's a good time to be serving God is what I mean. So I have received a lot of requests from people asking me about a certain kind of study. And I've mentioned this before to you uh, by sharing study tips and ways of looking at the Bible. Um, but I preached a message Friday night at Peak that I entitled A Letter to Theophilus. And in there, I broke down what the name Theophilus means. And I get, every time I do that, I get a lot of emails or, or texts from people that ask, how do I know that? Where do you go to learn how to do that? And I want to give you a little tool today. I've touched on it. My brother's touched on it. Uh, and with Dr. Jeremy Painter, we touched on it um, previously. But I, I want to maybe give you a little more firm understanding of it. I want to talk to you a little bit about etymology. Etymology. It's a kind of a funny sounding word. A lot of people don't know what that is. Some, some do. Some of you will be familiar with it. But if you're a preacher or if you are a serious student of the Word of God, it is worth your time to learn about etymology. It will enrich your Bible knowledge and your awareness greatly. And, and part of the message I preached Friday was that, that both the book of Luke and the book of Acts start out with a greeting to this party named Theophilus. The former treatise have I made, O Theophilus, of all that Jesus began both to do and teach, having a more perfect understanding. I have set this in order, seeing as how many have taken in hand to set forth, I will do it, having a more uh, sure understanding, a more excellent understanding, a more perfect understanding. Basically, Luke was saying, we were there, we saw it, we know what happened, and so we're going to make an accurate record of it. And he gives this to this Theophilus. Now, some feel that there's a guy there named Theophilus, but um, another school of thought is that it's a general greeting to a people, a general people of all ages, of throughout all time. It's an open letter to all people who love God. And the reason we say that is because the name Theophilus 
it could be a specific person he was referring to. But there is also the idea that he's writing to you. He's writing to me. Now, we know that because all Scripture is given to us for that reason. But in particular, he addresses it to a specific, if not a person, maybe a kind of person, who is Theophilus. And the reason I say that is because Theophilus is made of two words, Theo and Philo. Those words are, the idea of etymology is it's the breaking down of our current English language into the parent languages that it came from, that it stems from. And so this comes from Greek. Theos means God. And Philos means love. So it's two words that mean Theophilus. It's, it's written Theophilus, and it means God lover or lover of God. And so when the Bible says that the day would come when men would be lovers of pleasure more than lovers of God, you can read that lovers of pleasure more than a Theophilus. And so this is a letter written to all people in the ages to come who would love him and they will take the time to read it. They will take the time to parse the scriptures, to search the scriptures. The Bible says whether those things were so the, the Jews at Berea were more noble than those Jews that were at Thessalonica because they searched the scripture daily, whether those things were so. And you can only do that if you are a Theophilus, if you're a God lover, if you are a lover of religion, you will not understand the book of Acts. If you are a philosopher, see that word philosopher comes from the same kind of root. There's philo, which means lover. And then there's sophia, which is wisdom. And that sophos, sophia, that's the same root of sophomore. And, and it, it means wisdom. So a philo, sophie, it is a lover of, of wisdom, and it's a human wisdom, and there is your Aristotle, your Plato, your Socrates, all the, the famous um, Greek scholars that formed the foundation of Western civilization, the Greco-Roman mindset. Um, they, they gave us a lot of valuable things, but it is not the word of God, and, and there's a lot of perversions and distortions that, that if you view them through the Greco-Roman lens, you are going to come up with a false teaching. And a lot of the doctrine of the Trinity comes from a Hellenized Greco-Roman construct. And so, so many Trinitarian scholars, they think that oneness scholars don't know this, that we don't know how to tell the difference between being and personhood. Well, we do. We just know that the more you try to parse that philosophically, the further from the authentic rendering you get. This is a Hebrew message and the oneness nature of God cannot be compromised. You can't break it down any further, and the more you do that, the Bible says that in him dwells all the fullness of the Godhead bodily, and you are complete in him. And beware, lest any man spoil you through philosophy. And so I'm not a philosopher. I'm a Theophilus. Every generation needs a Theophilus. Every generation needs a Peter, a James, a John, needs a Titus, a Timothy. And, and if you go back in the Old Testament, you'll find God lovers. And today, I'm talking to God lovers. I'm talking to a Theophilus today. And if you try to interpret the Scripture from a philosophical standpoint or from a religious loving standpoint rather than a God loving or a Theophilus standpoint, you're going to misinterpret it. You're going to stop at Matthew 28, 19 and not go any further. You're going to view Matthew 28, 19 as the, as the, the standalone model for baptism. You ignore Luke 24, 47. You ignore John 20, 21. You ignore uh, Mark 16, where it talks about things being done in his name. Life is through his name. Repentance and remission of sins is through his name. Um, these things will happen in my name. And so we know the name of the Father, Son, and Holy Ghost. When you, when you put it in the context of all four accounts of that one gospel, it's his name. It's the name of Jesus. And a God lover is going to search that. They're going to go to Acts 4.12. There's no other name under heaven given among men whereby we must be saved. It takes a God lover to search that out. And you, you can see 
the idea begin to emerge from an etymological approach to the scripture. So, Theophilus, that's where the idea comes from. Well, I'm not going to re-preach the message. Um, they have it. You can download it. But it was a great time Friday night. It was a wonderful Spirit of God that was there. And, and etymologically, I began to approach the Scripture and break it down from its Greek and its Latin roots. So they don't teach etymology like they used to. They used to make etymology a part of, of the curriculum. They would teach it to students here in the United States, but for whatever reason, they got rid of it many, many years ago. And now students are being brought into such a, a crazy uh, curricula that now they're being dumbed down. The, the, the TV generation, the Hollywood generation, the video game, and the digitization of, of our, young, our younger generation, people don't think for themselves. They lose the ability of, to, to have critical thought. They lose their cognitive skills, and so they don't read. They can't sit through a service. They, if they hear preaching, they want it to be over in 15 minutes. A, a true God lover, a lover of God, a Theophilus, is going to say, keep preaching. I'm learning. I'm growing. I am loving the Word of God because I'm built on the Word. There is power in the Word, and that's where this etymology really shines is when you develop a love for the Word of God. The Bible says this, in the beginning was the Word. And the word was with God and the word was God. God is the word. He's the living word. He's the logos. That word, word, (laughs) is logos. And so think about that. That logos is the wisdom of God or the idea of God or the thought of God. And it's inseparable from God. That's why it can be God and be with God. And his word went forth. His thought went forth and it became flesh. And so it's the extension of God. It's the going forth of God, and it becomes the man, Christ Jesus. He is the Word in flesh. And the Bible says all things were made by him. Who? The Word, Jesus. He is the agent of all creation. He is the agent of redemption. And the Bible calls it the Word, the Word of God, the Logos of God. That word Logos, you use it all the time, whether you know it or not. It is the root, and and it's, it probably bears saying this before I dive into all of this, is that in etymology there are roots and there are suffixes and there are prefixes. Prefixes come before, suffixes come after. And then there's a root. And logos is the root of all of our ology words. All of our ology words. So if you have biology... You can, you can define that you know, by the modern definition, which is um, the study of life, um, the study of organic dynamics, how life came to be. Some of you might define it as a school, that, a subject you didn't do that great in in school, <laughs> or maybe you loved it, maybe it was your thing. Um, but if you broke it down etymologically, bio means life, and ology means study of or the word of. And that L-O-G that's in the middle of ology is logos. So arche means ancient. Ology means logos. So it's the wisdom of ancient things or ancient wisdom. Biology is life wisdom or life knowledge. Um, on and on. I mean, you can go all the ology words that you want to think of. It all has to do with the knowledge of or the wisdom of. Um, the idea of ology. And so you use that all the time. You are talking about the Logos. And I am telling you that the Logos is Jesus Christ. He is the Word of God. And so when scientists are looking at biology and archaeology and paleontology and all of the ologies that, that they are studying, they're looking at the fingerprints of Jesus. He is before all things. All of those ologies, he's before them. And by him, all things consist. So this is where logos etymologically plays a role in our life. So if you've ever used the word ology at the end of any of your school subjects or maybe your profession, you're looking at logos in action. So I want to show how to look at a word etymologically and the benefit that can bring to you. The Bible is filled with this. If you've ever looked at the the suffix L in the Bible, L is 
is a is the etymological derivative of Elohim. It's a name for God. And so whenever you see L, E L, dash E L, it's it comes at the end of Hebrew names. It means God. And so, I mean, just go through them. Samuel, Ezekiel, Daniel, Joel, JL, the feminine of Joel. Um on and on and on. And it means God. So Dan L means the judge of God. My name is Nathaniel. It means giver of God or gift of God. So that L that's tacked onto the end, God's name was always supposed to be woven through the fabric of our lives. And that is the foundation of the revelation of Jesus' name baptism. The name of God is supposed to be woven through your life. It was all woven through the Old Testament. Joel, uh, Jehovah is God. That's a, a J-O and E-L. Those are both contractions of bigger words. Jehovah, J-O, and E-L, which is Elohim. Jehovah is God. Um, all that, that, that Elohim was always to be part of our name, part of our life, part of our existence. So when we get baptized in Jesus' name, that is a very organic idea to an apostolic because going back to the Hebrew foundation of the name of God being sacred to us, we put his name upon us in baptism when we're baptized. Um, the name Samuel is fascinating. You know, if you read it in Hebrew, it's not Samuel, it's Shemuel. And I love it. I love to study that because that name Shem is the same name of Ham, you know, that comes from Ham, Shem, and Japheth, one of the sons of Noah. And you know what it means? It means name. Shem means name. So Shemuel means the name of God. And Shem becomes the father of all of the Middle Eastern people. So if you're Arabic, if you are Assyrian, um, if you are Hebrew, you are a, a Shemitic people. You are from the line of Shem, which that then became Semitic. And it's where the idea of anti Semitism comes from or anti Shemitism. You are against Shem. You are against Sem. You are against the line, the Shemitic line, the line that the Savior, the Redeemer would come through. Um, and literally, you're anti name. You're against the name of God. Anti Semitism, you're against the name of God. You're against the people of God, the chosen people of God. And we see that in Palestine um, where where they're constantly fighting and at war with Israel. We see it uh, among the Arab nations as there's conflict between the Hebrews and the Arabs, uh, the Israelis and the Arabs, the Arab world. That is a, a form of anti-Semitism. Um, here in the United States, when there's assaults on Jewish people, when they're, when you know Hitler is the ultimate anti-Semite, the expression of, of an anti or against the Shemitic line, you, that will become obvious to you when you learn etymology and you see how there are roots to all of these terms and these terminologies. So Shemuel anoints the kings. He anoints Saul. He anoints David. He, he is the anointer. He is the one who breaks the line of the judges and ushers in the line of the kings. And so you can literally say that the name of God anointed them. There's anointing in the name of God. Praise God. I could preach on that right there. Um, and that's what Samuel was. We call him Samuel, but but he is, originally it's Shemuel in the original language. You know, Jerusalem, you know, that idea, that, that the end there, the suffix is Salem. And going all the way back to Melchizedek, who is the king of Salem, that is, that Salem on the end of it is the suffix at the end of Jerusalem. And that word Salem is Shalom. Peace. And if you were to read that in Hebrew, it would be Yerushalayim, the city of peace. And um, it's, just, it's just a fascinating study. The name Bethlehem is a beautiful word etymologically. Um, Beth means house. It means house of. So whenever you see the word Beth, I'll say like the word Beth-El. So El means God. Beth is house of God. 
Bethel. And then when when Jacob went back to worship the Lord, he changed the name a second time and didn't call it Bethel. He called it El Bethel, the God of the house of God. And so etymologically, that comes to life. It springs to life, and it gives you a texture and a richness to the Word of God beyond just the Scripture and just the, the actual English knowledge that you'd get from you know a dictionary or a concordance. Etymology will give you a richness and a texture to it that normally you couldn't have. <clears throat> so Bethel means house of God. El Bethel means God of the house of God. Lechem means bread. So Beth Lechem is the house of bread. And literally, Bethlehem feeds the world. It's the house of bread because the bread was born in Bethlehem. Out of, out of thee, O Bethlehem, will come a Savior, a Redeemer, though thou art small among the nations. And so the bread of life comes down into the earth at Bethlehem, and Jesus feeds the world. Praise God. That will preach. That will forevermore preach. And Jesus is the bread of life. I am fed by him. I'm fed by his words. I'm, I'm fed by his presence and his, his will. And he is the savior of the world. He's born in the house of bread, Bethlehem. So all of this is etymology. It's how etymology works and fits together. If you, if you get, begin to get a basic knowledge of it, it will greatly enrich and enhance you. I told my young ministers about this. Sunday morning, we have a young minister session where we just sit down and we go over the Word of God. Um, so you, you'll see this, you know, this suffix L. You'll see it at the end of um, Ezekiel. And it's, you know, Samuel, like I said, but, but it's also a prefix. So this is why it's Elijah. El-jah. Elijah means Elohim is Jehovah. Elisha, or what they would say, Elishua, is very closely related to Yeshua, or Yeshua. Yeshua is, Jehovah is salvation, and is Joshua, basically. If you're a Josh or a Joshua, your name is Jesus. It's a derivative of Jesus. Elishua, or Elisha, is Jehovah is salvation, or is Elohim is salvation. Elisha and Yeshua Elisha and Jesus are very closely related etymologically. And so it's just a fascinating glimpse into the word of the Lord and how those prefixes, suffixes, and roots, those Hebrew roots, Greek roots, and even Latin roots, how they, they play a role in our life. One that really interested me, and I, I preached on this um, Sunday night, I think it was, was one day I was reading about the the tribe of Gad, I like the uh, Genesis chapter 49. I like that chapter because it is where Israel blesses his sons. He blesses them. He curses them. He, he talks about um, negative things that would happen. He talked about positive things that would happen. And based on their character and their traits, what they were going to become in the future. And that old prophet looked into the future in the Holy Ghost and saw the supernatural realities that these men would fulfill. And he talks about Reuben. He's unstable as water. He talks about Levi and uh, Judah. Instruments of cruelty are in their habitation. He talks about Dan. He talks about Asher. On and on. <clears throat> but when he gets to Gad, etymologically, you know, when I was young, I was working my way through a Strong's Concordance, and I was, I was just finding out what each of these names meant, and what a fascinating study that is. I love Genesis 49. Reading it, I, I looked up each one of these names. You know, Judah means praise and, and so on and so forth. You can look up each one of them. But Gad caught my attention because Gad means a troop or an assembly, an assemblage. And it's not a, a positive assembly. You know, the idea is of, of riot or aggression Maybe a mob might be an apt word. So a troop, a troop has a symbol. The troop has come. And what Israel says of him is, Gad, a troop shall overcome him, but in the end he shall prevail. 
Well, if you're reading the Bible and you're just kind of skimming along through that, you can skip right over that and think, well, that's kind of a weird little way of saying that. But every word in that Bible is true. Every word in that Bible matters. It, it, it means something. God's got something to say. And, and if you put it in the Bible, it is for the ages. It is for the eons. It is for the epochs of, of, of men, the ages of men. So a troop shall overcome him, but in the end he shall prevail. And the idea of a troop is part and parcel with Gad. And I, I went to the Strong's Concordance, and you can look this up in any Strong's Concordance or BibleHub.com. You can go to the Greek um, breakdown of what Gad means, or Hebrew breakdown, rather. And it calls it a troop, an assembly, a, a riotous gathering. And then at the end of all of these descriptive words for Gad, it says that they will cut themselves. So it, that, that lends the idea of violence, chaos, disorder. And I remember being stunned by that, to cut oneself. And I read that and I thought, wow, what a weird thing to have here in these definitions. And so if you are interested in studying and learning more about this, you can go to Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. You can go to where the, gad, the word gad is in there. It's got a little Hebrew number next to it. And you can click on that number, and all these interesting little descriptive words that gad means will pop up. You can do that on BibleHub.com. You can do it from, you know, back in the old day, days, I had a big Strong's Exhaustive Concordance. It weighed like, I don't know, 10 pounds. And it's this huge concordance that was exhaustive. I mean, every word in the Bible's in there. And, um, man, I would lug it everywhere. It would <laughs> it'd wear grooves in my shoulders and my backpack, and, it, you know, it was heavy. And, but I loved it. I'd, I'd, I'd sit down, and I'd just break down those words. Now I've got a laptop, and I can look it up online, thank God. But here at the end of it is they will cut themselves or to cut oneself. Well, now, there, as you study the Bible, your mind should immediately go to wherever there's a riotous, motley crew that is out of order, that is assembled, that cuts themselves. And the first place I went to is Mount Carmel when, when Elijah is there. Um, Elohim is Jehovah, is confronting the mob, confronting the horde. By some accounts, they think there were 400 false prophets. Some say there were as many as 800, because if you read it closely, it looks like there were 400 prophets of Baal and 400 prophets of the groves. So it could have been as much as 800 false prophets who were leading Israel astray. And then there's the whole nation of Israel and they, they're uh, engaging in Baal worship and Elijah confronts them. You know, if God is the God of heaven, then worship him. But if Baal is, then worship him. And the God that answers by fire, let him be God. What a powerful metaphor for Pentecost. If I had the time, I'd talk to you about how, how, the death of the bullock that Elijah had and the water that was given there and the fire that fell is a metaphor for repentance, baptism in Jesus' name, and the infilling of the Holy Ghost. Those elements will always be where the fire falls. And Pentecost is all about the fire falling. You should have been at church at FPC on Sunday night. The fire fell and the power of God rocked that house. And if you're Pentecostal, then you've got that same heritage where there's death, there's washing, and then the fire falls. That's how Elijah brought fire down from heaven. Um, and there's a lot more to that that we could get into, by the way. But I digress. He goes on from there, and there's this horde of Baal worshipers and, and the people. And the Bible says that as they worship Baal and the false gods, that they cried out to Baal. He wouldn't answer them. And so to get his attention, they began to cut themselves. They be, the blood began to flow. They began to sacrifice their bodies, mutilate their bodies. This was a pagan thing. Um, you know, you can go all the way back to the book of Leviticus where they made marks in their body for the dead and they cut themselves and, and we see renderings of this in modern day society. You know, people are tattooing themselves, they're cutting themselves, they're mutilating their bodies, they're piercing their bodies. It's all pagan heathenism that, that has continued into this world. And you could find it in, uh, ancient, the ancient Britons and the Goths and the Vandals and the Visigoths and uh, Native Americans that were here when we got here and other primitive cultures down in the Amazon and Africa and out in the, the far lands of China and the Russian steppes. It's like any Mongolian horde of Genghis Khan or, or, or any civilization of the past. Um, 
And here we got it in our metropolis areas. We've got them in our big cities. Young people think it's cool. They think it's new. They think it's some strange thing. I mean, we're not just a half step away from dancing around the fire and mutilating our bodies at any point in time. And that's what happens when you don't know the word of God and you don't realize your body's the temple of God and you don't have to mutilate what God gave you. Um, so they cut themselves and the blood is running and Baal never does answer. And doing that is never the answer. God's got a much better plan for you. He's got fire that can fall from heaven and it'll consume the sacrifice. So we see the motley crowd cutting themselves, mutilating their bodies. And we see that that's Gad. That's the troop. It's this gathering, this multitude, this assembly who is out of order, who is crazy. The, in Psalms chapter two, the Bible says that the kings of the earth, they and, and the people, the citizens of the earth, they have gathered themselves against the Lord and his anointed. Why do the heathen rage and the people imagine a vain thing? That's Gad. That's the troop. That's the assemblage that rages against God. If you go to any concert, any metal concert, any rock concert, there's a rage against God and a lust for pleasure and power. Uh, Hip hop, it's a railing against God and the created order of God and a, and a glorifying of, of, of man and, and sin. That's all the cutting. It's all of the mutilation. It's when the troop overcomes you. And we see this idea in the Bible. But where it really got me, guys, is one day when I read about, you know, I, I can see Israel. There he is. His sons are being paraded before him. He's getting ready to die. His eyes are dim. And he sees Gad. And he says, a troop shall overcome him. But in the end, he shall prevail. I always wondered what he, was, what he saw in that moment. Because obviously he's there. He's in a tent or, or wherever he was. And, and his sons are there and he's in there. And, and physically he sees that. But I always wondered what he saw spiritually to make him say that. And the poet in me begins to, begins to wax verbose, begins to grow loquacious. <laughs> Big fancy words that means I want to start talking. I want to see it through the eyes of the Spirit. And I just wonder if, if Israel in his old age lifted up his eyes and saw further than just the physical and saw into the spiritual, if he saw the day of Jesus. I like to think he did. That day when a boat bumped up onto a sandy shore, Jesus got off into the country, the country of the Gadarenes. You can read that, you can skip past it, but it is the land of Gad. And there was a man there, exceedingly fierce. One gospel account says there were two men that met him out of the tombs. But in the one account, it just tells the story of the one. He's a son of Gad. Jesus said, what is your name? He said, my name is Legion, for we are many. There was a troop. It had overcome him. Legions of devils tormented him. How many people have been so engaged in sin, have gone so deep into depravity, an abomination that they brought back devils with them that talk to them, that insinuate things, that speak day and night to them. What activities have people engaged in that, that they brought back hitchhikers that, that depress them and discourage them and even make them suicidal? And if you're out there and you wrestle with suicide or you think you're worthless or you think you're no good, I want you to hear me and hear me good here at this network. I want you to know that God loves you. He cares for you. Those thoughts are not thoughts from him. They are thoughts from Satan, from, the, from, from wickedness, from devils that want to drive you into a devil's hell. And God's got a better plan for you. And there is a man named Jesus. He is Jehovah's salvation. He, is, he brings salvation and he sets captives free. The Bible said they tried to bind him with chains and he would pluck them asunder. No man could bind him. He was exceedingly fierce. No man might pass by that way. Jesus said, what is your name? And he said, my name is Legion, for we are many. That's the troop that had overcome. Maybe you're going to school and you're dealing with a, a lot of 
ungodliness. Maybe you're on your job and you got to face a troop every time you go in. Maybe you are with family that don't love God, don't serve God, and you feel like you're all alone out on an island and you're dealing with a troop. Or maybe you just got all kind of devils talking to you from past lifestyles that make you want to give up and throw in the towel. Don't ever let the troop take your life, dominate you, steal from you. David said it like this, the Lord is my light. He's my salvation. Whom shall I fear? The Lord is the strength of my life. Of whom shall I be afraid? When the wicked, even mine enemies, came against me to eat up my flesh, they stumbled and fell, and though an host should encamp against me, in this will I be confident. God has given deliverance from the host, from the troop, from the motley crowd. That day, a son of Gad met a son of God. He met Jesus. And he cast the devils out of him. And the troop had overcome Gad. But in the end, he prevailed. What a beautiful illustration of the power of Jesus Christ and an old prophecy. I believe that though Israel's eyes were dim, he saw into the prophetic. He saw into the beautiful, holy presence of God. He saw the future. And he saw Gad overcome by a horde. But in the end, there's one who would come and Jesus would set him free. So that is just a little etymological excursion. It's just a little voyage into a a way of looking at the scripture that I hope it helps you. I hope it strengthens you and edifies you. You can buy a book for on etymology. You can you can go to etymology.com or I think it's etymyonline.com, if I'm not mistaken. And you can look up Greek, Hebrew, Latin roots. You'd be amazed at what you'd find. And when you look at the scripture, you won't look at it as just a narrative anymore. But it, rather than one definition, you'll see seven possibilities pop up. Multiple, multiple possibilities. As you see, not just the word, but the parent word that it springs from. And it will enrich you. It will strengthen you. And that's what we want to do. Biblos is about the books. It's about a love for the word of God and the things of God. And I hope we could be some kind of a blessing to you today. So God bless you. God keep you. Until next week, we love you. We appreciate you. Can't wait to see you later on. God bless.